crystals in that area and a low concentration of crystal light in that area. Okay? This, if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, it's going to draw in water. Let me, let me go on and show you what I mean by this. Let me, uh, this draws in water. Hypertonic, it's going to be more concentrated. Isotonic is the same. Let me just show you the picture. It'll make more sense. We have two environments. We've got a cell that has inside the cell and outside the cell. So the two environments is inside the cell and outside the cell. Okay? My mnemonic is water follows solute. Water goes where there's more concentration of solute. Let's look at this picture. Forget about these pictures for a moment. Just look at this one here. This is a cell, and you have dots inside and outside the cell. The dots represent, let's say, salt. Okay? Let's say sodium. There is a membrane around the cell, the cell membrane. It's going to allow things to cross either way, but it's not going to allow the sodium to cross. So the only thing we got in here is water. So water is the only thing that's going to cross over there. Okay? There's a certain concentration. They're very close together, the salt <laughs> molecules, the sodium molecules, or ions. Okay? Out here, they're kind of spacious. So this cell is going into a hypotonic solution. The hypotonic solution is this solution here where there's more water on the outside. It's not concentrated here. It's more concentrated inside the cell. You can see how close the dots are. Okay? When you put this cell inside a hypotonic solution, water is the only thing that can pass through that membrane. And it wants to make the space between the dots equal inside and outside the cell. The water is the only thing that can pass through that membrane. Those dots cannot. So in order to make it equally spaced, would you expect water to go into the cell or out of the cell? Into the cell. When it goes into the cell, now look at the spacing between the dots here inside the cell and the dots here outside the cell. It's equal. It's like saying, you know, you want to have 50 people inside the, the room here and two people out there. Well, it's going to go out there until it becomes 50-50 so that no more water and no more students can go out or in. It's equal. So if water goes in, the cell swells. Sometimes it might swell so much that it bursts, like a balloon would, okay? But cells will swell here, okay? Questions about that? All right, let's look at this one here. We're putting a cell into what we call a hypertonic solution. This is where there's less water in between the dots on the outside of the cell. Inside, there's more spacing. When you put this in here, the only thing that can pass through that membrane again is the water. So to make it equal spacing on inside and outside the cell, would you want water to, would you expect water to leave the cell or enter the cell? Leave the cell. Leave the cell. And when it leaves, now the equal spacing between the dots inside the cell and outside the cell. Because the water left here, it shrinks, it shrivels. We use the proper name as it crenates. This is called crenation, when it shrinks like that. Okay? What we're saying here, my mnemonic, was water follows solute. Water is going to go where there's a more concentration happening. It, more concentration of solutes. Water goes where there's a more concentration of solute. Water follows solutes. Okay? A good example of this is go to the beach, something you probably won't be able to do during these few weeks that we're going to spend together in the summer. But when you go in the ocean, the ocean is very salty, right? You go in the ocean, you're in there for five minutes, what happens to your fingertips? Yeah, they get you shrivel up, they wrinkle up. Why? Reason why is because your body's trying to do something. It'll never do it because you've got a lot of homeostasis and negative feedback going on inside your body. But what it's going to try and do is water's going to escape from your body to try and dilute the ocean. 
it's not going to do that though. Because what happens is your thirst mechanism realizes that you have a little bit of water in you and it says, I got to rush into the shore and get some of that fruit punch. Okay? So your body does that, but if you're out there for a long time, you can get dehydrated. Okay? And this is what we call isotonic. Isotonic is when the equal amount of concentration is inside the cell and outside the cell. There won't be any movement of water happening there. And that's the ideal thing, is isotonic. Okay? Questions about this? All right? This is kind of showing the same thing. You do this on your own, except we got a membrane in the middle there. Okay? So what do cells do? When you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, it lyses. Lysis means to burst. All right? If it doesn't quite burst, it swells. So water, more water is going to enter the cell. When you put a cell in a hypertonic solution, the water will leave the cell and it will shrivel. Or the better word is crenate or crenation. And think of what happens to your fingers in an ocean. Okay? Filtration. It's another form that doesn't really, that just happens naturally. Works like a strainer. God bless you. As long as there's enough pressure, then it'll push the, the fluid forward. Or not just fluid, anything. A good way I can explain this is think of coffee. Right, you got to make you know percolating and coffee, and you put the uh, you have the filter in there, and if there's no pressure, the water's not going to go through there. But if you've got more pressure, more water in there, it's going to press through and it'll go right through the filter. Does that make sense? So you got to have pressure there, and if there's pressure, it's going to just do naturally. It's just going to go from a high pressure to a low pressure. Okay, and we'll see that when we get into the kidneys also. So those are the three forms of transport mechanisms that don't use any assistance. Here's three forms that use assistance. Okay? They may involve carrier proteins, meaning this has to fit right in here, and it'll grab it and push it down. Some characteristics of this is that if we use carrier, carrier proteins, they have to fit like a lock and key. Otherwise, it won't go through there, okay? The other characteristic is that we can have competition going on. Competition, we could have two structures that look alike but aren't the same thing. And when that happens, they're going to compete for the same carrier as the ones that you see on the board there or on the uh, PowerPoint. Okay? One's red, one's blue. They both are going to fight for that one on there. Okay? And there's saturation. Meaning, if we only have, let's say, if we only have two doors to the room over here, we've got 50 people here, it's going to take some time to get you out here. If there's like two people in here, it happens very fast. If you've got 10 people in here, they're only going to take two at a time. So it does the saturation. We only have so many carrier proteins there, that's all it's going to take on. It can only do like a certain number. Okay? If there's two here, then or two carrier proteins, it'll take the two that's over here. If there's only two carrier proteins, and you got six or eight of these over here, it's going to take some time. We're limited to how many carrier proteins we have on that cell. So facilitated diffusion goes from a high to lower concentration because it's diffusion, okay? And it must be attached to a carrier protein. If there's no carrier protein, it's not going to happen. So that's why a carrier protein is the assistance it needs. A baby can't come into this room unless it's being carried by its mom. Otherwise, we are not going to allow a baby to come into this room. I'm using it as an example. Babies aren't allowed in the room anyway, but I'm just, you know what I'm saying, okay? No energy is needed to do this. 
Okay, the mother comes in, brings the baby, that's fine. You don't need a special amount of money to, to come in, it's fine, okay? It may release energy as heat, though. So it won't use it, but it may release heat. All right, this is just showing you that this has to fit into here, and then it opens up and allows it to come inside. Carrier protein. Another way is that we can actually open it up by putting a keyhole or a, something that goes binds over here and that opens it up and allows it to come in. As long as that's, the keyhole is, is being filled with something, it will open. All right, now let's do active transport or primary active transport, okay? This is going against the gradient. going from a low concentration to a high. That is not natural. So let's go back to the same scenario me flatulating with Deva and Alyssa, okay? I flatulate here, okay? It's going from a high concentration to a low. Faba does not want to smell that. So she wants to make sure that she could put the concentration going from a low concentration to where she is back to a high concentration. That's not natural. But what can Faba do if she's nailed to the, to the floor there and she can't get up? What can she do to make sure she can put the smell going from a low concentration to a high concentration? What can she do? Help her. What's that? Yeah, she can do this, right? Blow it away with this. Or take the fan that's behind her, plug it in, and blow it that way. She could go from a low concentration to a high concentration. However, she has to use energy. ATP is needed to do this. Okay? It's possible. But you got to have ATP to do this. Okay? Does that make sense? All right? So in the kidneys, a good example of this. We have things called sodium potassium pumps to do that. Sodium potassium. There's more potassium inside and it wants to go out, but somehow we gotta put the potassium back in. We're gonna go from a low potassium out there to a high potassium inside. Same way as sodium. Sodium is gonna be outside more and it comes in, but now we gotta put it back out there. We're gonna go from a low concentration to a high. So we have a pump that's also known as the ATPase pump or the sodium potassium pump and it's going to put them out there where they're supposed to be, okay? And it's this, doing that, okay? It's gonna go from low concentration to a high concentration. So let's talk about this sodium potassium pump. Okay, I did this in the chemistry thing, but I might as well do it over here too. You do need to know that there is more potassium inside the cell, and you need to know about more sodium outside the cell. Somebody who's already smiling because you saw my PowerPoint, right? My lecture. So you know where I'm going with this. There's cations and anions. In essence, cations have a positive charge, anions have a negative charge. We'll learn about that in the chemistry lecture. But you do need to know what's the most abundant anion outside the cell, most abundant anion inside the cell. Most abundant cation outside the cell, most abundant cation inside the cell. Potassium has a positive charge. Sodium has a positive charge. So this is how I memorized it. I call it the salty banana. Learned this from kindergarten. What is potassium loaded with? Yeah, tumble. 
Yeah, what did I say? Yeah. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted like, like you said, I did this all the time. And, okay, yeah. So what is a banana loaded with? Yes. There you go. That's the answer I was looking for. Man, I, okay. Good thing. Good thing. Okay. It's been a long night. Okay. So yeah, potassium. So the potassium is loaded inside here. So think of the banana as your cell. Inside, it's loaded with potassium. Outside, sodium chloride is salt. Sodium is a positive charge. So you have sodium out here. That's a symbol for sodium. And we also have chloride out here, which has a negative charge. Inside this banana, we have this positive charge. So the most abundant cation is sodium outside the cell. The most abundant anion outside the cell is chloride. The most abundant uh, cation inside the cell is then potassium. The other one, you'll just have to memorize it, but the other one is the most abundant um, anion is phosphate. That's the only part you've got to memorize, okay, because I don't have that part in there. So. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong, there is potassium outside the cell, there is sodium inside the cell. There's just a lot more potassium inside the cell, and there's a lot more sodium outside the cell. So if the sodium channels open up, sodium wants to come in. That's the fusion. If potassium channels open up, potassium wants to go out. That's the fusion. But we got to put the potassium back. We have to put the sodium back. Now, for like sodium, we're going to go from a low concentration of sodium into a high concentration of sodium. The sodium potassium pump is going to do that. Okay? It's going to put that there. It's going against the create gradient. Okay? And you'll get to know that a little bit later, much later, uh, and you'll see it like in the neuron, the kidney, and ATP is needed to do this. What it does is that it puts three sodium out of the cell and two potassium back into the cell. You do need to know three and two. So here's a little mnemonic also that came to me also. Okay? You ever hear that song, uh, na 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 na, hey hey, not, you know what I'm yeah. talking about? Okay. All right. So this actually came to me. So you listen to the song, na na na, now just listen, na. Now how do you spell na? Perfect so far, right? Okay, so I'm going na na na. How many times did I say that? Three, three. three times, which works perfectly. So then you put the whole thing together. Na 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 out, na 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 out. KK goes inside. I don't have much of a social life. <laughs> okay, but. Those little things, instead of you going and memorizing all the stuff, that's what I'm trying to do is wire your brain for your future so you can make things that are complex into something that's manageable, okay? All right, so anyway, you now know about the salty banana, you know about my na 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 song, I'm probably not gonna sing ever again for you guys, all right? But I have other mnemonics, so don't worry about that. Question? Why is this We'll get into it later on. I'm just giving an example of when you would see active transport. But you're going to see this. You're going to get to know this in a few weeks. Why this is three and two, and when he would use this. But we, you know, as sodium comes in, we got to put the sodium back out. But how is that going to happen if you have less sodium inside and more sodium outside? You're going against the gradient. The sodium potassium pump is going to do this. Okay. And the potassium, the same way, it's got to go back inside. They just work together. Okay. It's still in this kind of thing here. So two potassium go in. Three sodium go out. It's one pump that does that. And ATP is needed to do that. Okay? So you can look at that on your own. It's a sodium potassium pump. You'll get to know it. All right, secondary active transport. Okay. This one is kind of a neat thing. It moves again, it moves against the gradient, but it's not going to use ATP. It's going to use the energy of something else to do their, their, their magic. Okay, it's going to go from a low concentration to a high concentration. And the best way I could explain this one is think of a windmill or a water mill. I'll show you. Here's a house. And the house needs to be lit up. 
to an electric. So what does it do? It's going to have its electrical power sent to or coming from a generator. And the generator, a very loud thing, and I think most people know what this is all about when you have Hurricane Sandy and stuff, but it sits in a place, you know, outside the house, with a loud noise thing. And as long as you are cranking this, it's going to turn on the electricity over here. It's producing electricity. But with you being out here, cranking this thing, you're going to be there for hours and days to keep on doing that. You got to have it keep on turning, okay? So that's not going to be very helpful. So what we have is water, a river that's happening nearby, and we're going to have a water mill. over here. So as the water comes down here, this water mill is going to turn. Do you see why? Okay? And if we have this water mill hooked up to the generator, you see what's happening here? It's a long drawn out thing and I bet no teacher can actually will explain it this way. All right? But look, What's going to happen here is as this is turning, it's going to crank this, which is going to give you electricity. And in a basis, that's what's happening. Windmills work the same way and stuff. Okay? But this is why I'm doing this. It's because we're using a sort of power from something else, the water here, to give you electricity. Not from you turning the thing. You're piggybacking off of something else. Does that make sense? That's what's happening with the secondary active transport. It's going to allow something to come into the cell or out of the cell, but it's going to use the energy from something else. Because normally it can't go from a low concentration to a high. So it's not using energy, meaning ATP, you're using something else. Okay? So that's why I said, think of a water mill, a windmill. You're using the, the, the power of the wind, the power of the water to be doing this, okay? Sodium is the most common driving force for other molecules to enter the cell. So it's going to use sodium. As sodium comes in, it kind of opens up the doors for other things, okay? But think of it like the windmill. That's how it's working. Okay, now we have two ways, two types of the secondary active transport. There's something called co-transport, which means that it's going to, whatever this substance is, it's going to go in the same direction as the power source. Let's say sodium. Let's say, for instance, me being a teacher in this room, everyone left the room except for one person, okay, um, and she has books in her hands and she can't open up the door. Well, I'm leaving the room. She wants to leave the room. She's going to use me, my power, to open up the door. As I'm going out, she'll be going out with me. You see what I'm saying? We're using, she's using the power of me to open up the door. That's what we call co-transport, or also known as symport. But then we also have powder transport which is also known as anti-transport, and this goes in different directions. Let's say there's a student outside the room and she can't come in because her hands are all filled. So she's gonna wait for me to leave the room, so I'm gonna open up the door, I'm gonna go out, but because the door is now open, she can come in. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the difference between symport and anti-port. You're using the power of something else, whether you're going to go in with it together or you're going in opposite directions. No ATP is used on this. You're using the source of something else. So in this case, let's say the blue and the blue triangles and the blue and the red dots, 
they're going in the same way. Maybe it's using the source of the triangles over here, and that's allowing the red dots to come in and they can both go in the same direction. Or, as a blue dot is going this way and then goes out, it's actually going to open up the other side over here and allow one to come back that way. Does that make sense? Can you visualize it? Yeah. Okay. If you want to use this, that's the door thing. Uh, I'll open the door. It's showing a waiter, but I'm opening up the door, allowing the balls to go in with me. Or I'm going to open up the door, going this way, but the balls will go the other way, or whichever. The triangles go the other way. Whatever works best for you. All right? But you're going to hear secondary transport and active transport all throughout the rest of A and P1 and 2. Okay? These are just miscellaneous transport mechanisms. Endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is something where it's going to the cell will invaginate around something, engulf something, and bring it in. Okay? This does require ATP as energy. We have two types of endocytosis. If it's going to bring in a liquid, we call it pinocytosis. If it's going to bring in a solid like bacteria, it's going to be phagocytosis. These are two types of endocytosis. And you can see here, this is a cell here, and here's a particle, let's say a bacteria. It's going to engulf that and bring it in. If it's a solid, it's, it's um, phagocytosis. Yeah? What's that? Phagocytosis, pH, pH. Oh yeah, yeah, phagocytosis, pH, yep. I thought you were talking about pH, like scale. Oh, no. Chemistry, okay. Yep, phagocytosis with pH. Yep. All right, mm-hmm. So this is just showing you that it's, here's a close-up of the membrane going around here and brings it in, okay? Then we have exocytosis. This also requires energy, ATP. And this is going to do the opposite. It's going to, whatever it's making inside the cell, which we're going to talk about after break, whatever it's making inside the cell is going to put it out there, outside the cell. Okay? So if this is what we got to get, these little green dots, and this is inside the cell, this here is going to fuse with the cell membrane and is able to put all those balls outside the cell. That's exocytosis. One's bringing things in, one's putting things out. Okay, and they both use ATP. 